Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Well, we're so glad that you're at Mesa Church this morning. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, and as I look around, I'm reminded if you want to sit in the back row, you got to get here early. Um, <laughs> but thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we welcome you to Mesa Church. My name is Keith Robinson. I'm the lead pastor here. We like to have fun at our church, if you didn't know that. Um, and, you know, we're in a series right now, and, and we just want to welcome everyone. If this is your first time or first time in a long time, we are in the middle of a series right now where I've been sharing my vision and uh, pieces of my heart that are so dear to me as we think about the future of our church. And, of course, if you've been at Mesa for any amount of time, you know that the name Mesa means table. And so when we say there's always room at the table, that really is our DNA. That's our heart, that every single person would find a place at the table. And when you think about a table this morning, you probably think about a lot of things. How many of you uh, in this room, you have memories of growing up, being at the table with loved ones, family members, friends, right? We all have those experiences in our lives. And um, when our children were, were little, I remember this one particular, I believe it was like a Saturday morning, and we were up early, and our kids had gotten up early, and uh, we were making pancakes for them, and both boys at the time, probably five years of age, maybe uh, maybe five and, and two or, or three and six or something at that time, and uh, we got some, some other persons preaching to us in the back, maybe, I don't know, we got that? All right, great. But I... <laughs> forgive our technical difficulty. It was really throwing me off. But um, I was like, am I answering myself right now? I don't know what's happening. So when my children were, when they were little, uh, again, uh, right around that, that age when preschool, elementary age, and, and I've got two boys, me and my wife, Samantha, we've got two boys who are now 19 and 16. But when they were younger, we were making a breakfast this one particular morning, and the pancakes were starting to, you know, the smell and the aroma of that was starting to fill the house. And both boys came downstairs and they were so excited for pancakes. And I found them kind of wrestling, you know, with each other over who would get to the stack of pancakes first. And my wife, being the good mother that she is, she heard them arguing. And she said, you know, boys, if Jesus were here this morning, he would probably say, let my brother have the first pancake. And uh, my oldest son, being the clever one that he is, looked at his younger brother and said, Hey, Jude, you can be Jesus today. <laughs> um, our scripture this morning is in Luke chapter 24. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. Luke chapter 24. We're going to come to a story today that's a familiar passage of scripture. If you've been in church for any amount of time, you may have heard this story um, and as I was preparing this message, there's so much content that's here. And if you have your uh, app this morning, the Mesa app, you can follow along. There's a lot of notes there. I hope we'll be able to get to them all, uh, as well as the Bible verses. But we're going to start in Luke chapter 24 as we continue the series called The Table. And I'm going to read the entirety of this story. So it's more verses than I would normally read in one setting. But there's so much uh, happening here that I just felt that it was important to read the entirety of this story. So I hope... You'll follow along, starting in verse 13 of Luke 24. It says, now that same day, now this is the day of the resurrection of Jesus. So this is the event that's happening. On that same day, two of them, that's Jesus' followers, disciples, so that's what's happening. So two of Jesus' disciples on the day of the resurrection were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with one another, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. If you're underlining anything in your Bible, you might underline that Jesus himself walked along with them. And it says in verse 16, but they were kept from recognizing him. Interesting. Verse 17, and Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. 
He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Now, again, they're talking to this man who they do not know is Jesus. And they're telling Jesus about himself. So get the irony of what's happening here. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Verse 20, the chief priests and the rulers handed him over to, to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us everything that they had seen, or rather told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as, as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. In verse 30, and when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open. And they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned to Jerusalem at once. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened along the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This morning, I want to talk to us about the power of revelation. The power of revelation. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been in this series, and during the first week, we talked about the power of an invitation. We've all been invited somewhere and realized the significance of what happens when we receive an invitation. And last week, we talked about the power of participation, what it means to engage in the table, in conversation. And this week, we're going to talk about the power of revelation from our scripture today in Luke chapter 24. Now, I want us to all, in this moment, if you would, I'm going to invite everyone in the room to stand as we pray this morning over hearing God's word. Please stand with me. And as you're standing, I just want to take a moment, and I want us to also include in our prayer a prayer for someone in our congregation, uh, Sandy Morgan, right there. Uh, Sandy is, uh, and her husband Gene, who is a, a dear brother in the Lord, and just a wonderful couple that God has blessed Mesa Church with their, uh, their presence here. But Sandy will be traveling to Ghana to meet with the Executive Council of the World Fellowship, Assemblies of God, um, which reaches 151 countries and has around 69 million members worldwide. We're part of that fellowship. And Sandy serves as the co-chair of the Commission on Human Trafficking. Uh, and she's going to be going to Ghana to present a report on current events that are happening to combat human trafficking. And um, she's planning on sharing a brief at that council on the plans to strategically expand that work, um, to organize regional leaders who will strengthen the church's efforts for human trafficking. Um, in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, Paul tells us that if you want your love to abound, we need knowledge and insight, and ultimately we will bring glory to God. And her prayer request is that we can all uh, equip churches in these 151 countries around the globe that are combating human trafficking. So because these are two precious people who are part of our table here at Mesa, and Sandy is going out, as we pray over hearing God's word today, I want those that are around Sandy, if you would, just put your arms around her, put your hands on her shoulder. If you want to extend your hand that way, we want to pray over Sandy as well. Father God, thank you so much for today, and thank you for your word. 
We ask that you would speak to our hearts and transform our lives. We also ask you, Lord, for our sister Sandy, that you would go with her, go before her, Lord, as she presents uh, at, this, at this event, Lord, that you would be with her, give her traveling mercies, watch over her and protect her, give her favor, and Lord, anoint her as she shares your truth. I pray that there would be great wisdom that is shared, and through that effort and initiative that many people would be saved and set free from human trafficking. Lord, we pray your blessing upon her and bless Gene as he stays here and holds down the fort. Lord, just watch over and protect him and God bring them back together at the appointed time. We thank you again for her work. Go with her and go before her. We commit her to you in Jesus name. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. So here's what's happening in Luke chapter 24. Jesus meets two of his own disciples on the road to Emmaus. This event is happening on the very day of the resurrection. And like all observant Jews of the day, uh, these two disciples, they had made their pilgrimage to the city of Jerusalem for the Passover. So there would have been a lot of activity happening at the time. And of course, these disciples are not only there for Passover, they're there to be with Jesus. They have most likely shared in his very last meal. Um, as you notice up here, we have a table that's set that's symbolic this morning. Don't worry, we're not all going to drink from those two cups. Uh, but it's symbolic this morning of the Lord's Supper, which was really, in that day, was the Passover. It was a meal that Jewish people still to this day, they share with one another. And in those days, it would have been shared by many people who were coming from all over the Middle East. All of the faithful, observant Jews would have, been, would have come to Jerusalem for Passover. And these disciples now have left Jerusalem. They are on their way back to their home. It's after the events of Christ's trial of his crucifixion. And what they don't realize the event of his resurrection has also taken place, but they don't know that yet. They don't know that Jesus himself is alive. In fact, all of their hopes, all of their dreams were set on this rabbi becoming the Messiah. In those days, when we hear the word disciple or follower of Jesus, understand that in those days that there were individuals who were rabbis. They were teachers that other individuals would follow. And most rabbis had a school or a following of people. And so you would quote your rabbi. You would talk about your rabbi's interpretation of Torah and the understanding of Scripture. So these disciples of this Jesus, they saw him as a rabbi, but they saw him as more than just a teacher. They saw him as the one who was promised to come. And now their hopes and their dreams that had been set on this rabbi of theirs becoming the king now it seems like all hope was lost. And their understanding of the Old Testament, the Messiah that was to be promised, was to be a liberator. Not someone who would die, but someone who would be triumphant over all the powers that be. And in fact, in the Old Testament, there's this pattern of God's people always wanting a king. In fact, we're told at one point that that desire for, for a king was a sinful desire. They wanted someone to rule over them. They wanted someone to be their leader. But interestingly enough, here we find thousands of years later that the same want, the same desire, it's sort of embedded into human nature that we want someone to liberate us. We want someone to free us from oppression, from tyranny. And we think about our own world today and all of the craziness that is the United States and the politics that are happening right now. And my message is not to preach on that this morning, but I think it's very interesting that humans have a bent of putting their hope in human people. We have this, this bent, this, this proclivity, if you will, to want someone to rule over us. We want someone to establish righteousness and to make things better. So that desire is innate. It's, nothing's changed, by the way. The wrapping looks a lot different in today's culture, in today's day and age, but it's the same human behavior that happened thousands of years before our story today and happened thousands of years before our current time. It's the same thing playing out over and over. And these individuals, these two disciples, they had witnessed Jesus die on the cross, and now they're returning home on the road to Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they wonder, how could I have missed it? How did things turn out like this? 
And if you notice the tone of the text, the disciples are filled with disillusionment and disbelief. There is great confusion and despair at everything that has happened to them. And their hopes were nailed to that cross and buried in that grave. I've shared this thought before, but it's something that I want to encourage us with. And the bottom line for today's message is that life is best understood in light of his eternal purposes. Life is best understood in light of his eternal purposes. And that's what we see in today's story because without that light of God's eternal purpose, their life did not make sense. Every single person that's born on the, on the planet asks a few questions. Why am I here? Where do I come from? And what is my purpose? Why am I here? That's the first question every single person asks. Why am I here? Am I just an oops? Am I just an accident? What purpose does my life have? And life, again, is best understood in light of his eternal purposes. And like the disciples, there's confusion, there's despair oftentimes in our lives. And when we look at our lives, we can see the things that have happened to us. And we can easily begin to dismiss everything that's happened to us and feel disappointed. But disappointment is the result of unmet expectations. Disappointment is the result of unmet expect, expectations. And I believe that today under the sound of my voice, there are people who are sitting here and you are disappointed with what you have. Disappointed by how life has played out for you. Maybe there are prayers that you've prayed that have gone, on, gone unanswered for years. Perhaps you're feeling let down by God today. Take comfort in Luke 24, our story, that these were two disciples who had felt completely let down by God. And it's okay to admit that today. Oftentimes we want to hide behind religious jargon, but the reality is, if we're, if we're being honest with ourselves, is that sometimes we feel as though God has let us down. C.S. Lewis said this about pain. He said, pain insists on be, being attended to. Pain insists on being attended to. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And maybe today the pain in your life feels so looming, feels so large, and you feel disappointed with God. I'm reminded of a story of a dear mother who had lost her only child, a son, in an auto accident. Her son was 17 years of age. She, he was a model student, rarely gave his parents any trouble, but he left this earth at such a young age. And the mother was broken and so distraught, and eventually she became bitter and totally resentful toward God. And she cried out, in the anguish of her soul again and again, where were you, God, when my child needed you? She felt a prolonged sense of silence from God with no apparent answer, and it drove her into even deeper levels of despair. And she found herself living with what seemed to be an enormous gulf that separated her from the God that she had loved since the time she was a young child. And after suffering in that dungeon of bitterness for years and not allowing anyone to talk to her about God's grace or his goodness, one day alone when she was crying, she reached out in desperation to God and said, where were you when my son died? After saying that, she was exhausted and fell across her bed. But within a few moments, a silence came into that bedroom and there a tender loving voice spoke back to her. The same place I was when my son died. If you've ever lost something that you've loved, or someone that you loved, rather, and you've been in that place of despair, take comfort, my friend. These two disciples found themselves in a place wondering, how did it go so wrong? Why did it turn out like this? You see, the difference between, between what we want and what we get is where our faith often falters. 
The difference between what we want and what we get is where our faith often falters. But this is precisely where Jesus meets us. It is precisely where he meets us. Jesus shows up in their pain. Can I tell you this morning that you are not alone? No matter how bad it feels, no matter how painful it feels, no matter the heartache, the despair, Jesus comes to walk with us in our pain, in our heartaches. He listens to our complaints. Maybe you feel as though you're in a dark place today. John Piper says this, our dark certainties are not sureties. Sometimes we look at our lives and we think for, cer for certain that God has abandoned us, that God has left us to our own devices, that the way that things have played out will have the final word. But be reminded this morning that our dark certainties, the things that we are certain will destroy us, they are not sureties. In fact, our story today reminds us that Jesus will have the final word. But can I tell you, it can be tough to trust God when we feel depressed. And you know what? The first thing we pull back on when we feel depressed that they, is the very thing that we need the most. The thing that we pull back on when we feel depressed is the very thing that we need most. Prayer and community. Those are two things that God has designed us for, connection with Him and connection with others. In fact, the two greatest commandments are fulfilled in such that we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourself. Those two things cannot be fulfilled without prayer and community, but when we feel depressed, those are the very things that we pull back away from. And the reason that this message on the table is so important is because, yes, it is an invitation to participate in prayer and community. And when you do, something powerful happens in your life called revelation. Revelation can just be simply said as the aha moment. It's the moment that the light bulb goes on. And all the lights come on and you start to see clearly what it is that God is doing. But today in our struggle, when we are disappointed... It can be hard to find the energy to participate. We don't feel like showing up. We don't feel like giving. We don't feel like serving. We don't feel like being involved. And that's where faith can falter and even maybe the dangerous place of where we stop believing. And maybe you're in church today because someone brought you back after a long time. We're so glad that you're here. Maybe you've had a hard time believing because you've grown up disappointed. Maybe the people that were supposed to come through for you didn't. Maybe you thought God should have come through for you in a certain way, and he didn't. So if you've grown despondent, if you've given up hope, if you've given up on God, be encouraged today. For those of you that are wary of God and not so sure, can I tell you that sometimes we lack faith in God's power, but more often we lack faith in his goodness. See, these disciples didn't lack a faith in God's power, they lacked faith in God's goodness, that God was actually for them. In verse 16, it says about these disciples, they were kept from recognizing him. Oh, my friends, if I could just encourage you this morning, if I could give you anything, it would be the gift of perspective. To see life, your life in particular, as God sees it. We see what's temporary, but he sees what's eternal. And he wants to give us our, his eyes this morning. It says they were kept from recognizing him. What's holding you back from seeing him today? What stands in your way of seeing him? Whatever it is, can I tell you that the table is a place of revelation. It's a place of revelation. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm woken up in the morning, you know, there's, there's sort of two ways to wake someone up. You can come into the room, you can flip all the lights on, kick down the door and say, hey, I would just advise you if you're waking up teenagers, try that once, see how that goes. <laughs> but I prefer to be woken up a little slower, you know, let the lights come up slowly, sip a cup of coffee, quiet conversation, just a little insight into me, but that's, that's sort of how I enjoy being woken up in the morning, kind of ease into the day. But how many of you know sometimes God kicks down the door and turns all the lights on? And then there are other moments where he just kind of lets us 
come into realization over time. Well, today in Luke 24, that's the moment that's happening. It's, you can see the tenderness of Jesus as he lovingly leads them to this revelation, to the aha. In verse 17, Jesus asks, what are you discussing together as you go along? Now, it would not have been unusual for Jewish travelers to welcome a stranger to join their company as they're walking after this pilgrimage. So this was a, would have been a normal thing. So they welcomed the company of this stranger, not knowing that it's Jesus himself. But like all good teachers, Jesus asks us questions to which he already knows the answer to test our understanding. Jesus is a good teacher, and he asks us questions to which he already knows the answer in order to test our understanding. Watch this. In verse 17, look at the exchange. It says they stood there, their faces downcast. They stood still with their faces downcast. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? Do you get the contrast of what they're talking about the one, talking to the one that they're talking about? And they can't see him. And they accuse Jesus of being a noob. <laughs> it's short for newbie. Okay. Uh, he, are you a newbie to Jerusalem that you don't understand what's happening? And sometimes we want to make this accusation to God. God, do you not look down and see my suffering? Do you not see my finances? Do you not see my marriage? Do you not see my children? God, do you not see my situation today? Are you a noob? What is happening? Why do you act as though you don't understand what's going on? And I love Jesus. He says, what things? Your complaint is safe with Jesus. It's safe with Jesus. Whatever it is, you can pour it out to God. That's why the table has to be a safe place for conversation, my friends. It has to be a safe place where you bring your doubts, you bring your objections, you bring your complaints. It's okay. Jesus has big enough shoulders to bear them all. You see, the best teachers don't just tell you the answers. They show you how to find them. Jesus is the good teacher. He doesn't just tell them the answer. He says, what things? He shows them how to find him. And then in verse 19 through 24, they begin to recount to Jesus all the events that have happened. There's a gap, though, between what they've experienced and understanding what God is doing. And you and I, we live in that gap. We live in the gap between what God has done and what he's promised and what we've experienced. And so it's in that place that revelation occurs. In verse 25, Jesus says to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all the things that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Can I tell you this morning that scripture is God's gift to help us understand everything from his perspective? Scripture is God's gift to help us understand everything from his perspective perspective and this is why my friends that our lives have to be built on the foundation of his word because if it's built on anything else it is all shifting sand because the pain and the temporary things that we walk through in this life will feel daunting and feel so real that there's no other side there's nothing else left except this which i'm experiencing but my friend in the same way that jesus began with Moses and then the prophets, he began to reveal himself through Scripture. This is a beautiful picture of what God wants to do in our lives because Scripture is God's gift to help us understand everything from his perspective. And because life is best understood in light of his eternal purposes, he showed them the truth. And here was the truth. The first truth is that suffering was the necessary prelude to the Messiah's victory. Suffering was the necessary prelude to the Messiah's victory. And along with that, Jesus' suffering allowed him to become our Savior. It's his suffering that allowed him to become our Savior. Now, this didn't fit their expectation. They wanted an earthly king to save them from their temporary pain, as we all do. But Jesus reminds them that the Messiah came to save people from their sins first, 
and give them eternal life. We want a temporary solution to an eternal problem. But can I tell you this morning, our pain is temporary so long as our perspective is eternal. Our pain is temporary so long as our perspective is eternal. Like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, we can welcome Jesus into our pain, into our doubts, into our confusion, into our suffering. And when we do, we will learn this important truth, and it's this, because he's in control, I can be confident in his plan. Because he's in control, I can be confident in his plan. Toward the end of our story, we find that these disciples, as they're talking with Jesus, and the lights start to come on, and they're realizing what he's saying. It says, as they approach, to Emma, approach Emmaus, Jesus acts as if he's going to go further, sort of baiting them for an invitation. But the disciples, it says, they urge him to stay with them, still not knowing that it's Jesus. And it's in this simple act of hospitality, inviting Jesus to their table, that everything changes. And we watch as the story unfolds, it says that he, Jesus, takes the bread and he breaks it. And as he breaks it, their eyes are open and they recognize him. It was in the breaking of that bread, don't miss this, that they see him for who he is. Jesus breaks the bread. Now that was that honor was reserved for the head of the home. I mean, if I invite you to my home, I, I will break the bread and distribute. But when we invite Jesus into our lives, when he is the guest at our table, he wants to break the bread. He wants to show himself to us. He acts as the owner of the house. He breaks the bread and their eyes are open. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, my favorite passages of Scripture, and one that I would encourage you to memorize because it will come back to you often. Revelation 3, 20, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart today, and he is knocking. And by the way, this is a message for believers, because it's often our disillusionment and disappointment where our faith falters. And so he comes to us in our times of despair and our times of disillusionment, and he knocks on that door, and he wants us to let him in. Don't keep the Lord waiting any longer, my friend. He is knocking today. Open the door and let him in already. He says, and if anyone opens that door... I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I love the reflection of the disciples on the heels of this encounter. They go back and they tell everyone, did our not hearts not burn within us as he spoke with us and revealed the scriptures to us? Can I tell you today that the greater the revelation, the greater the transformation. The greater the revelation, the greater the the transformation. Life is best lived in light of eternity. It is best understood in light of eternity. The revelation that he wants to give to your heart and to your life is that everything you've been through has not caught him off guard. He knows every aspect of our lives. It says he knows the number of hairs on our head, which seems like a greater feat for some of us than others, but... But it's true this morning that God knows our days. He knows everything we've walked through. And he invites us to the table. To his table. In fact, he wants your table to become his table. Will you make his table your table this morning? I thought an appropriate way for us to conclude our service and to come to a place of worship today as we think about what he has done for us. And when you came in this morning, you likely received the communion elements. If you did not receive those, this little cup and, and bread, would you please just slip up a hand at this moment? Some of our ushers are going now to ensure that you have one. 
please raise your hand. Those will be distributed. For those of you that received these when you came in, I encourage you to open the top there and pull out that wafer and hold that for just a moment. What revelation do you need this morning of his love, of his care for you, of his kindness toward you? As you hold that wafer in your hand this morning, it's an opportunity for you to reflect on the suffering that he chose to demonstrate his love to you. Suffering was necessary. Why? Because the Bible says that he was tempted in every way that we are. He went through all of our suffering, and it says that we have a a high priest now who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That means that he's moved by what moves you. He's burdened by what you carry this morning. He cares. And he's got shoulders enough to bear it. His suffering that he endured allowed him to become your Savior. And so all across this room, I'm going to invite you to stand this morning and take the bread in hand. And right now, if there is pain in your life or separation from God, maybe you've allowed yourself to wander. We're all going to pray in just a moment, but as we do, maybe this is a moment of surrender to you or for you, where you surrender all to Jesus again. He's in control, so you can be confident in his plan. So with heads bowed, eyes closed right now all across this room. What's keeping you from him today? What separates you from him? He has paid the ultimate price. And he wants to open your eyes this morning, the eyes of your heart to see him, to receive him today. And if you need to receive him, I want to invite you and everyone here this morning to pray these words with me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to me today. Thank you, Jesus, for not leaving me alone. I admit I need you in my life. More today than ever before. I need you. So I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me and make me new. From this moment on, I am yours and you are mine. Come live your life in me and through me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Could we take this bread this morning with thanks in our hearts? for the broken body of Jesus that was broken for us. Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken. Let us receive the bread together. And now as you take the cup in your hand, this morning the the juice, the cup, is representative of his blood that was shed for us. In the Old Testament, it said that without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. So Jesus himself offers his life as the sacrifice willingly to lay it down so that all of our suffering, that all of our pain would make sense in light of his eternal purposes. And so this morning, if you need forgiveness, if you need cleansing, if you need healing, As we receive this cup together, let's do so with thanksgiving in our hearts, knowing that he paid the ultimate price so that we could be free. Lord, we thank you for your blood that was shed this morning for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you, Lord, that your eternal purposes for us will be accomplished because of who you are and what you have done. And Lord, we receive this cup this morning with gratitude in our hearts, so thankful for revealing to us the truth of your love and your mercy. Thank you again, Lord, for all you have done for us. We receive it with gratitude in Jesus' name. Let us receive the cup together. Now, in this room this morning, there is one appropriate response to this, and that is to worship. Like the disciples who that morning, or that evening, rather, when they had that meal with Jesus, their eyes were open, their hearts burned within them this morning god wants to set our hearts on fire for him for his presence for his love and the way that we respond to him is indicative of the deep work that he's done within us 
The greater the revelation, the greater the transformation. So this morning we say, God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, for not leaving us alone. We have hope because of what you have done. And our response this morning is worship. So Lord, this morning, come into this place, receive our praise, receive our worship as we offer it to you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. We love you, God, and we worship you today. Let's worship together in this place.